Well, good morning. We are here at the Clearwater Historical Society Museum with another gentleman interview for our podcast. Uh, my name is Marvin Seipel, third generation Florida. Went to school here, as did my parents. Uh, today we are joined by Courtney Ross. You might have re remembered Ross Yacht Service on Island Estates. Uh, we're going to go back into the, the history of Clearwater, the working waterfront, and a uh, trip down memory lane. So uh, I'd like to introduce, it's our pleasure to have Courtney Ross with us today. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? Excellent, excellent. So you <coughs> came to Clearwater how long ago? Kind of bring us up to date from where you started when you came to Clearwater as a youngster to Courtney Ross and uh, Ross Yacht Service and uh, where you are today. Well, I originally came to Clearwater. My father was a lighthouse keeper on the Great Lakes, and when he retired, uh, decided to move down to Florida. So they told me, they informed me that they were moving to Clearwater, which was a, a rather small town at that time. This was about 70, 73 years ago. And we moved here and uh, just always grew up to that point around the water. Which my dad's profession, and uh, just started hanging around the waterfront and got to know Clark Mills up in Dunedin, the boat builder up there, and it just, uh, just kind of grew from that to where during high school years, I went to high school, Clearwater High School, I would work on boats and do things through my spending money and everything in Clearwater Beach, and, and then gradually uh, grew up grew into where I started to do boat maintenance. Uh, after I got out of high school, I was in photography a little bit. I was doing some professional sailing. And then I uh, just started doing boat maintenance around you know, Clearwater, and it kept growing, working out of a truck. And got to work with another gentleman, Bill, Bill Graham, he and I together. He was working out of, we were both working out of the truck, and we was, uh, to this day, still the best of friends. And it gradually grew into what became a boat yard on Island Estates when Island Estates became reality. And uh, we had that over the years. And then after, uh, after Ross Yacht Service got sold, uh, it ended up in a brokerage business for about 10 years that we opened up in Dunedin. Now, you're, you're Speaking so modestly of Ross Yacht Service, didn't you uh, tell us? I know you kind of jumping ahead. Uh, Jack Eckerd's boat, the Panacea, um, he was quite a storied and famous, at least locally, uh, sailboat racer. And you played a pretty good part in that sailboat, didn't you? Well, yeah, because Charlie Morgan built these boats <clears throat> like. Jack Eckert's boat was the Panacea. Charlie Morgan built that, and a lot of other very nice custom boats, as well as production line boats. And we would, they would come up to our yard, and we would do the final paint work on them and the final finish work on them. And that grew into where we had a, a series of races here in Florida called the SORC, Southern Ocean Racing Conference. And boats would show up from that from all over the world. Uh, it was a big, big thing, to, and so gradually we'd end up with maybe 40 of them in the yard at a time getting ready for that series for two 40. Four zero. Yeah. We'd have a lot of them out of the water, a lot of them just on moorings out in front of the boat yard, and we had a, it looked like the International uh, international Homeless Society with all the different crews from the different <laughs> boats from all over the world, and it was it was a lot of a lot of work and a lot of fun. Well, that that goes back to the niche that you carved out on the working waterfront, which is largely a thing of the past. Um, where uh, Ross Yacht was at the time, that's now Island Way Grill and the Clearwater Marine Aquarium, correct? Yeah, that's not Island Way Grill was that was always a separate thing. Where the uh, Marine Aquarium garage is is where Ross Yacht used. To. Right. And I remember Midway Botel was right next to that. I worked there one summer. Yeah, Pat Keith. Uh huh. Yeah. Botel was right next door, and uh, then we had, of course, down the street the restaurant, the Seaspire Restaurant, that kind of hung out over the <laughs> over the water down there. And, uh, but we had 
quite a collection of, we had a clientele that you never knew who was in the yard because they were who's who, everything from some governors of some states and some people that were CEOs of large companies that owned these racing yachts. And you just never quite knew who you were running shoulders with around the yard. But your yard and, and you by name were you were the kind of the kind of the go-to guy for and, and certainly became that for that group for the uh, Southern Ocean Racing Conference. For yeah, a lot of them. Then we had another yard down, a couple other small yards did a few of the boats. But then Sneed Island Boat Works down in Bradenton, they did a lot of them too. Mm -hmm. It was a rather large fleet, and uh, they did just like we did. We had a good we trade clientele back and forth even a lot according to who could get the job done. Oh, so when you came to Clearwater, <clears throat> um, you were just a just a kid. Uh, where did you go to elementary school? Well, I didn't go to elementary school here. I went. I started uh, in junior high school. Okay, junior high. And um, down there off Greenwood, Ave. right? Greenwood, there, the one that finally burned down. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the new high school out there. Of course, my mother and father they they had a house on Comet Avenue. Uh, so we watched the new high school being built all the time mm -hmm. because we lived out there. Of course, when I first moved here, they came down ahead of me. I'd gone to a Boy Scout jamboree somewhere, and then came, came back to my new home. Well, Skycrest was, there wasn't a tree to be seen. There were streets. Theirs was one of the very first houses. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, are we moving out in the middle of the Everglades? Um, and, and look at that now, right, in, yeah. in the middle. So uh, just kind of divert a little bit to what it was like to grow up on the waterfront. You grew up on the waterfront in the north, and you came here, and you're in landlocked Pinellas County, but the water was only about 10 minutes away. Um, kind of go over your, your reconnection to the waterfront locally. Well, everything like numerous of my friends that we all grew up together at the same time around here, around the waterfront and everything else, Clearwater was just a wonderful town for kids to grow up in, period. Waterfront was very friendly to us. We'd ride our bikes out there, riding home at night if you went down to work on a boat or do something, or just uh, go go sailing. Whatever you had an opportunity to be on the water, you know, riding home, you could stop on the causeway and right where the boat yard and Island Way Grill is now. You could, if it's low tide, you could see the see the scallops squirting up there, and you'd go get a bucket of scallops right off the causeway and <laughs> take them home real easily. Come home with dinner every night if you wanted Just to. About. And uh, even uh, I have some pictures at home of the, what's the aquarium now, which was the new sewer plant for Island of the States. Mm -hmm. I have some pictures at home where anything north of that was still mangroves, even hadn't even been dredged up yet. The Island of the States was developed in three phases, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was three phases, yeah. They wanted to go further, and luckily they stopped where they did. And who, um, I think that was uh, Skinner? It was Skinner, Haya, Gerlach. I think they were the three main okay. movers in that. There, there may have been some others, but those are the three that I knew really well. And the people don't realize just how far north Island States goes, unless you look at it on a map and realize that if Sunset Point Road extended straight across, it would go to just about the north end of Island States. It goes. It goes that that far north from from the causeway. Yes. Did you know there was an old hermit that lived out on uh, one of the, one of the mangrove islands? Right, that old schooner. Did you know him? We knew. I well, we can't say I really knew him. I think his kids. We probably harassed him <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, Dave Spalding was mentioning that they they used to throw their boats out there and go out. And uh, got got to got to know him a little bit, just uh, living out on that island out there. Yeah, that whole thing like that. That was all all of us. That was our playground. Yeah. With those islands. So it was wonderful. How much development was on the beach at that point in time? Not a lot. There wasn't none of the south end, and of course, up in the north end, 
the North Pass, which no longer exists, was Big Pass. Right. And then uh, you had the South Pass, which wasn't very good. That didn't get good until they built the jetties. And right. Now you're referring to the now closed in what was originally called Big Pass, subsequently became known as Dunedin Pass, and in the late 80s they removed the age to navigation. And Clearwater Pass, now between Clearwater Beach and Sand Key, was at one time known as Little Pass. Right. And as you mentioned, was barely navigable at certain tides. And I think you came in Big Pass to the north, and you could go around what they called Shears Pass, which would take you around over to Dunedin. Mm -hmm. Some of the old channel markers to this day are still out yep. there. And there's, there's a concrete piling in the middle of the mangroves in what it used to be a uh, channel marker right. going out Dunedin Pass. And if you know where it is, you can wander out in, in the mangroves and still find that, that concrete piling and point that out to people. It's in, literally in the middle of the land. And people are like, what is this? You tell them they, just, they, they can't fathom the, the force of Mother Nature. Yeah, I think if we, if we had that hurricane last summer, like sorry to say we were supposed to have, like it went somewhere else, I think we'd have a pass up there again because you can go up through inside the mangroves now, and it's just a very low hop yes. over into the Gulf. Yep, and it, it overwashes occasionally on a on a heavy tide. Yeah, it's so so beautiful back in there, though, mm -hmm. the mangroves, and just it's just like it's always been. Now, you had uh, any other notable? We mentioned Jack Eckert. Um, we in fact we'll be doing a, a podcast with uh, Captain Kai Lewis uh, a little bit later today. In fact, uh, be the next one in our series. Um, I know you had you crossed paths with many of the the names that would be synonymous with the waterfront here, like uh, Bob Ress, uh, Kai Lewis, Dave Spaulding, um, Wally Erickson. Just fill in your your connection with with any of those folks. Well, uh, Dave Spaulding and uh, Bob Ress, but you know. We're all friends, good friends and everything. We're all working on the waterfront in different ways. Bob Ress built our built our gantry and built our docks for the yard like everything else around here. Dave, he was getting started in his different charter boats and everything. And we, uh, we just all grew up playing together and working together. It was, it was, um, Erickson, he was, he was up in Tarpon Springs, but what a what an interesting person! I think the things that man accomplished and did are just phenomenal. We're working on a podcast with he and Bob Ress. Yeah, that'll be that'll be good because they have high respect for each other. I think. Yeah, they, they do, and to this to this day, still uh, still maintain a uh, a close a close friendship. Erickson did a wonderful book on his, his adventures. It's very very well done. The reason I had asked about the connection to some of those names, the going back to the working waterfront that Clearwater was, that Pinellas County was, that it's kind of morphed away from now and it's become kind of its own Disney World, so to speak. Um, to your knowledge, working boat yards, how many are left in the area compared to how many were around at one time? I know there was, of course, Ross Yacht, there was Clearwater Bay Marineways, there's a couple up in Tarpon. Um, I understand Gulf is back in operation uh, with Pittman. Um, but just then compared to now, I remember the Benson Shell Pit at the end of Bel Air Road. Yeah, well, of course, mainly in Clearwater was Clearwater Bay Marineways, which was forever. Then um, then our yard. And right now we don't have any working boat yards in Clearwater. No. You've got to go to Tarpon Springs. It's the nearest one, if you go south, you can get, go to Gulfport. Um, one or two, one small one down on Madeira Beach down there. But real proper boat yards. It's, that's kind of it. We just don't have anything in Clearwater. And there certainly is a demand for it, as there are so many boats floating in marinas and in dry stack marinas and on lifts behind people's homes. For example, Island Estates, how many residences are there? Do you have any idea? 
No, I really don't. It's, if you take the amount of boats that are in Clearwater, it's a lot of boats. Exactly. And, that's and what they're it's... getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more complicated. And it's, it's a little, little, little different. Yeah, who, who would have figured that to diagnose what's wrong with your outboard motor, you would need an electronics technician with a laptop, and we look at the uh, uh, one and a half horse Elgin that uh, Dave Spalding donated to us, which actually we, we have his first outboard motor. It was the very first motor on what is now the Queen Fleet. Um, how simple that was to fix or an engine like that compared to now with the technology that you need. The thousands of boats that are on island estates alone on lifts behind the thousands of homes that are up there compared to when it was all mangroves and you were out there stomping around getting scallops, yeah. stone crabs. Contrast what uh, what fishing was, what, what it was like to get dinner, so to speak, whether that was at a meat market, at a fish market, go get it yourself, trap it yourself, catch it yourself. Kind of contrast then to now. Well, it was just just so different from the, what, what we are now and everything which what way, uh, you know, you had, um, I've never been a fisherman, I've always been a sailor and whatnot, <laughs> but Bill, Billy Graham had worked with me, he's a big time fisherman, and of course they had Spalding and Kai, they're fishermen, we, we built each of them a boat, we built Kai and this Daisy Mays. Do you remember which one? No, I don't remember just which, which number of boat that was. You had to get wider boats to put the number. He had so many of them. Yeah, <laughs> well, we we did the one where um, after we built the boat, looking at how we we're going to paint it, I convinced him to paint the name full size on the side of it, Daisy May. I said, you know, you tried to attract the tourists, so make them so they can see you. Mm -hmm. I remember that boat well. <laughs> and uh, built Dave, a uh, 48-foot sport fisherman. At the same time, we built one for Maxie Foster. Was another one of the uh, charter fishermen there at the marina. Maxie just passed this last year, mm. but uh, we built he and Dave. I, you know, two two just pretty much the same boats at the same time. It's, we all inter, all intermingled. And we took we always, no matter how busy the yard was, we uh, we always took die if one of the commercial charter boatmen or Commercial people had a problem. We get them in the yard one way or another. You know, we, people sometimes be critical, say, "Well, why are you getting those fishing boats in here? You're not getting my boat in here." Well, we took care of them. But they, you had a problem. If you had a problem anywhere out there, you'd more than likely get towed to, by one of the fishermen over to Ross Yacht. It was just a good group of people. All yeah. Around. Well, that's, and that's what was so cool about the waterfront, and still is to a large degree. Mm -hmm. um, well, again, I, I grew up in Clearwater, and uh, you know, some of my first first memories on the on a water like that were deadheading on the Dixie Queen. I'd go out fishing all day for nothing. <laughs> you had to work all the way out and all the way back. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's how many of us grew up on, on a waterfront and, and learned what we did and met some of the people that we did. And just so fortunate to have many of those folks still around, uh, which is why we do these podcasts, to be able to share what Clearwater was with people that have only been here for, relatively speaking, a few number of years. Uh, people ask me, say, you lived here your whole life? My answer is, not yet. Yeah. So, now the, uh, you, you the, go into a little bit more the, the scope of the work. Uh, did you uh, did you do re repowers? And, and you did complete refits at Ross Yacht. We did just about anything. Okay. We, we did a lot of uh, <clears throat> commissioning of new boats. We had, we had Pinellas County had a lot of boat builders. You had Morgan Yacht, you had Irwin Yacht, you had Sarah Yacht. You had a lot of Gulf Star. And these builders were supplying to dealers all over the country that were their dealers. Well, their dealers would sell a boat and have it have it commissioned here in, in Florida for their customer to take delivery of. So we 
actually had in the boat sales business, a lot of our competitors were actually also our best customers, which was always interesting. So we, we did an awful lot of commissioning new vessels for builders, not only from around here, but builders from up north. And they'd say, you know, we're going to send a boat down to you to put together uh, we did several several boats that we highly customized for European customers. And, uh, and they, they'd get sailed over there. We, uh, we did all, all kinds of major renovations of boats. And it wasn't much of anything that we wouldn't take on and do. We, sailboats were real big specialty, but our boats were too. Now, in case anyone listening to this isn't familiar with what commissioning is, could you just a, a brief, uh, brief explanation? Well, you get a boat, get a boat built by a, a builder, and they take it just so far. Then it has to come and be all put in the water, tested out, uh, additional systems maybe added to it. Usually, a new owner then will add all sorts of things. Decide he wants to make some changes and just customize it, put, put his fingerprint on it. And so that, that was where we, uh, we specialized in that very much so. We did a lot of the charter boat fleets down in the islands all the way down to Grenada. We'd have the boats would leave here maybe 20, 20 at a time we would commission and they would then be with delivery crews sail down to the Caribbean for the charter boat trade. Um, wasn't much of anything we didn't get into in our customer base, like I say. You never who you never knew who was in the yard. Come come the weekend and whatnot. We did a lot several boats for Ted Turner. We did uh, you know, we we had people like a couple of the governors of different states that were big into ocean racing. We we had a very very wide variety of people. Uh, you know, we did like the bounty <clears throat> which is a square rigger that was used in the movie Mutiny on the Body. That was something Ted Turner owned. Mm. We built new masts for that, but not at one point. But much of anything we didn't, didn't oh, take on. Yeah, interesting. We touched on a couple of names there. Um, going down that, that thought process for a moment, can you think of anybody else that uh, a name that uh, is – pretty much synonymous, that, that everybody would recognize that name. And again, we, we're getting from you little pieces of just how how wide the uh, the reach, of the, the scope of Ross Yacht Service, um, and just how, how, how well known, I mean, worldwide. Uh, but if some of the names... Well, we'd had, we'd had people like, year after year, good customer, Chuck Kirsch, Kirsch, Kirsch Curtain Rods. Heard that name? Uh, the IBM people, some of them. We had the uh, uh, Texas Instrument, the head, head of that. He's one of our customers. He did a lot of ocean racing and usually did a new boat every couple of years. We didn't You know, these boats, the bottoms of these boats, we'd spend hours polishing them because they, they're really trying to beat everybody else in the racing. We had quite a few boats from New Zealand and Australia that came up here for the SORC, as well as um, the people of Sydney. It was a race that's around the world race, single-handed race, and uh, they, the people of Sydney, built boat, the Spirit of Sydney, which was a 70-footer, and they it came up from Australia to here and stayed with us about three months before the race started up in Newport, Rhode Island. Oh, wow. get, getting ready, you know, doing the final outfitting and kind of the trip up from Australia was a shakedown, shakedown cruise. And uh, we, had, uh, we had a lot of European boats that would come over from Great Britain and we did several Swedish boats. We did several, you know, it, it was... <laughs> Like I say, it was like an international meeting at times, especially the crews with a lot of characters. A lot of them were Australians and New Zealanders, and they were all experts in getting 
trouble. Work hard, play hard. <laughs> and Clearwater Beach was very conducive to playing hard. <laughs> and what era? That was in uh, throughout the throughout the seventies. Yes. Into into the eighties. Yes. Okay. Um, and if, if memory serves me correctly, you mentioned that where well, they came from internationally, and you mentioned that there were some other yards. As I recall at the time, your yard was sought after by by many of these folks. In other yeah, words, they could, was Snead Island. Right, but they, they could have gone, let's say there's, there's 10 yards that they could have gone to. You were always one of the top, if not the top, or certainly one of the top two or three throughout the entire country that were, were, were viewed as the place to go. Yeah, we were in the right place because the first race of the SRC was St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. The first race started out of So we were, you know, this is the natural part of the funnel for those all boats on the get. We had a lot of boats were built in Wisconsin by a firm called Palmer Johnson. Palmer Johnson built an awful lot of the racing sailboats out of aluminum and everything. It would get so cold up there, though, they couldn't get the final paint on. So I'd get this telephone call, hey, we're going to we're gonna load up baby on the truck, and it'll be down there next week. When you're going to have to paint it. We just can't get paint, paint on up here. We'd be, you know, we just never said no to anything. Sure. And what really made our place tick was we had a wonderful crew of guys for two months, three months before the SRC. They would work till 10 o'clock every night. They would work all weekends, whatever, whatever it took. And a lot of these crews that would show up here, bringing the boats here from these other places. Once they got here, they were without a job until the races racing started. But most of them were very versed at the sail makers, riggers, painters. So we'd put them on our payroll for that too two months, and that'd be great. We could almost double our staff without, we always made sure we were taking care of our local customers, you know, you know what, mm -hmm. you, did, you didn't want to put your customers, your local customers aside, and then all of a sudden everybody's gone and say, okay, now we got time for you. Sure. And these guys, good workers, work hard, so, and then they'd go away racing, and we'd go back down to our normal crew. A lot of boats would come back after the regatta was over, maybe to get ready, and some of them, have, a lot of them would be going from here. They would go to England for the Admiral's Cup or something like that. They might, the designer might decide he wanted to make some modification to them, take some lead out of the keel or this or that. Well, they, they'd come, a lot of them would come back to the yard for that. Some of them would go on north and do it up there. And then, uh, Charlie Morgan, he, he always had some new boat cooking or something cooking. We would, Called when he did one sixty footer, one of the first really big boats that he did. He calls me up at home one night, I'm painting this boat. And it's, Charlie, Billy, and I—we've never painted anything back then. Everything was brush, brush painted. We've never painted anything bigger than a thirty footer. Well, son, it's just two. This sixty footer is just two thirty footers end to end. <laughs> Come on, son. <laughs> Interesting customer that lived out on um, John Hayward, John D. Hayward, who lived out on uh, Bayside Drive. He was an Englishman. He held the patents, these oil rigs that raised up on their own legs and everything. And he was he was very much into sailboat racing, very in innovative. And he uh, just such an interesting gentleman. Not many people knew much about him. His office. He had a plaque hanging on the wall that was, uh, and one side was German, one side was an English transla translation. And it was from Einstein saying, John, you're absolutely right. I miscalculated that, that whatever it was at the time <laughs> and whatnot. You know, I mean, he was, uh, a lot of people didn't know, know much about John, but he was, uh, and he helped, he helped Bobby Ress out, and Bobby had some lost one of his barges and whatnot. He, John was always there for all of us young people that were trying to get going. Gruff old boy, but 
he liked the song and y'all liked him. He was pretty important. You guys, you guys probably rest about John Hayden. We'll, we'll do that. It's a very special person. And this, this is what makes, makes these interviews so much fun because we're able to take everybody back and share those times people that weren't here this is you know these things were before my time um but you know lo looking at, at even uh the, the next generation and the generation after that to realize what what this area was what clearwater was in particular and people that were that clearwater wouldn't be what it is and where it is today without people like you and at the time hey you were just the guy that liked working on boats and hanging out on the waterfront and and look look where it got us um, same thing with Bob Ress. Um, you know, look, you look at, at Dick Meisner. Started out with a uh, an old uh, World War II uh, surplus barge and a drag line, and and how these things have progressed. Uh, Wally Erickson, you know, the uh, Erickson pump that, uh, that that he designed, which has probably kept a lot of boats from sinking. Oh yeah, and just stuff he did of dredging up. You know, he dredged up. Some of the launching pads over Cape Canaveral and stuff. I don't know if you've read his book or not. I haven't. Make a point of it. He, it, it it's, it's almost humorous and the, the things he did. I mean, he was, he was a uh, typical of O. Clark Mills, we'll do it verbatim, but he'd you know, you know, every now and then look at him and say, Well, son, he says, I think y'all got it case of the alligator mouth and the tadpole tail. <laughs> 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 Anything came out of Clark Mills' mouth was well worth listening yeah. to. Yeah. He just, he, that was, that, that he, he had a handle on life and things. Yeah, the always, wisdom. Always had room for us kids, so, you know. The yeah. whole town did, you know, you could uh, tell somebody this is Downtown in Clearwater, I think it used to be you'd stop by the post office as kids on your bike going to the beach. Maybe you'd go in and there you had the blind man in the corner selling lifesavers and candy bars. We'd all go in and say, Oh, I'm just gonna get some lifesavers and you'd reach over on purpose and go for something else. Say, no, you're not, you're getting a heat bar. <laughs> <laughs> and we all picked on him and he picked 